I am so excited to announce that iDriver Classic is now sponsored by Adrian Flux, one of the UK's leading classic car insurers. If you're looking for classic car insurance, I've popped a link to Adrian Flux in the description box below. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back with the Ford Anglia 105e. You've seen it on Harry Potter, you've seen it on Heartbeat and if you've been with iDriver Classic for a while, you'll know that this car was in my very first car review video. I wanted to revisit it and give her the love and all the praise that she deserves, so I thought I'd just reshoot the video. So in today's video, we're gonna have a look at this amazing, very late registered 1968 Ford Anglia 105e. It's funny because filming this video took twice as long as usual because every time we stopped, somebody would come over and say, oh my God, I had one of those. That was my first car in a way that I haven't really experienced with any other car that we've tested in absolutely ages, which shows the pull that the Anglia had on people because the car was only manufactured from 1959 to 1967 in the UK, Australia and South Africa with just over 1 million units sold. In fact, it was so popular in its very short life that it set new records for Ford Dagenham when in its first full year of production, 1960, just over 191,000 cars left Dagenham which was a production volume record. And in fact, after that, I think from 1963, they then produced it from Halewood as well, which of course is near Liverpool. The Anglia was sold under the strap line of the world's most exciting light car, which for me, I don't think is an exaggeration because it certainly gave the UK buying audience a car which wasn't really like anything else that they'd ever been offered. Certainly not from the competition anyway. And with Ford having roots in America, it's no surprise to see that the car took styling cues from across the pond. So detailing that you'll see when we look around, like the backward slanted window, was something which was borrowed, certainly inspired, by things like the late 1950s Lincolns and Mercuries. Although if you've ever seen a Citroen and me, you'll have seen that they've got them as well. It's also got these fins to the rear, and they're definitely a lot more conservative than the likes of the Plymouth Fury that we took out earlier this year. But again, that's a very American idea. And this car was certainly a world away from what war-weary Brits have been used to seeing. And so for context, when this car was launched in 1959, rationing had only ended five years prior in the UK. So many families were kind of living not a grey life, but certainly a very conservative life because they were trying to rebuild everything after the war. If you look at pictures of Britain and certainly places like London and Coventry in the 50s and even through to the 60s, you can still see a lot of the bomb damage. You know, it was a world which is like nothing that we have today. And with that, as a nation in the 50s, we were far more reserved than our friends across the pond in America. And so our cars were a lot more reserved too. And I think that the Anglia got the ratio of US automotive excitement and all their fanfare to British sensibility just right in a way that, in my opinion, no other car ever really got at the time. And you can really tell that I love the Anglia. Now going back to that strap line of the world's most exciting light car, it didn't stop at the styling and in fact the base engine for this car, the engine that was available exclusively at launch, the 997cc, was designed for the Anglia. So it was an overhead valve straight for engine. It was pre-cross flow and it became known as the Kent. The 1198cc engine which was then introduced in 1962, featured a longer stroke and was brought to market as an option for the Anglia, but was also brought in for the launch of the Mark I Cortina. Now, the Kent engine isn't something I've massively talked about on the channel, but Ford loved it and it was really successful for them. And they stuck with it for a lot longer than you might think if you're not a Ford fan. And with variations and modifications to the injection and fueling, it was used all the way up to 2002 in the Ford car, or KA as some people call it, and the Ford Fiesta. The car we're testing today has the later 1198cc engine. The original 997cc is long gone because Joe drives quite quickly and he has replaced it. 
Now the newness didn't stop with the engine and the styling. It went through to the transmission unit as well. And British Ford at this point introduced a four speed manual box, which had synchro on the top three forward gears. But if you'd chosen one of the 1198 cars from 1962 onwards, you would have got a fully synchro box. And if you want to see an example of an earlier Ford gearbox in action, I did a video with Joe's dad Zephyr last year, which explains the three speed box in a little bit more detail. Now, when we look at these cars today and in historical automotive context, it's really no wonder as to why they were so popular because they weren't just bringing something new in terms of styling and engine and transmission options, they were economical and quick too. An independently tested 997cc car in 1959 produced a top speed of 73.8 miles per hour, an acceleration of 0 to 60 in 26.9 seconds, and a really impressive fuel consumption of over 40 miles per gallon, which puts its performance slightly above the popular competitor family car, the Morris Minor, which at this point only had the 948cc engine. The 1098 came in in 1961, 62, but then of course the Anglia was bringing in that 1198cc engine, so really it almost feels like Ford were that one step ahead. Now the car was made accessible for new car purchasers in a way that Ford hadn't really done as well before this particular car. So you've got three clear options, so you have the standard, the deluxe, and from 1962, you also had the Super. So the standard featured no exterior chrome, no glove box lid, and the rear windows didn't open. They were fixed glass. The grille was steel body colored instead of chrome in addition to other small differences. The Deluxe featured exterior chrome, including the chrome grille. There was chrome trim on the dash and the glove box lid and opening rear windows. I believe, but I haven't been able to fully confirm, the heater was also an optional extra, at least in the very early days. Now the Super, which was amazing, available from 1962, had padded dash, rear armrest with added exterior chrome, and of course the 1198cc engine and fully synchro box that I've already mentioned. Now, really weirdly, there was also the ability to upgrade your Deluxe to a Super, retaining the Deluxe trim or keeping the Deluxe mechanicals, basically swapping bits around, but this was rarely an option ever taken up. Now, I want to show you this car inside in a bit more detail, so let's hop inside and I'll show you what's going on. When the Anglia came into the world, it was being sold under Ford of England originally and it was sold with the marketing message five star motoring and they didn't let you forget that after you bought the car either because that star emblem is pretty much everywhere in this car from the steering wheel so we've got our five stars on there right through to the headlining and the sun visors which both have this fantastic fabric with the little stars woven into it and for me that's a detail that i just don't think that you get on modern everyday cars it's a beautiful finish now we already know by sitting in this car that we are in a deluxe because of the dash layout so they were slightly different in the standard the deluxe and the super so your standard you have the same metal dash that you would have had in this without the chrome trim in the deluxe you would have the chrome trim as we see here and in the super you had it's like a kind of a padded dash and you would have had that 1200 engine as standard now this one of course has been slightly modified and tweaked with for everyday running because it can sometimes be a little bit taxing to drive something like this in everyday traffic without any little tweaks here and there and I think it's been done quite sympathetically because Joe owned this, he's owned this now for about seven years and he owned it when he was a teenager. So the temptation to add tacky bits and pieces on was a very real thing at the time, but I think he's done a really nice job of it actually. So over here, we've got the glove box. As you can open that there, we've got a face mask and hand sanitizer. A 1960s car with a very 2020 vibe to it there. And then into the center, we've got our heater controls that I want to talk you through first. 
Now for me, I find these a little bit over egged and in fact, they were slightly modified. So the earlier Anglias had the, as part of this control, I think it was you pulled it to turn it on and off. But a lot of customers were going back to Ford and saying, well, it's not really working for me and it's a bit problematic. So instead they modified it on the later Anglias to sit over here. And this is something that I really love this car. It's one of my favorites of all the, the cars in the friendship group but this over here really niggles me so this black switch here is to turn the heater on and off but it just strikes me as a little bit out of place when everything else on there is chrome so for your heater you just adjust these dials quite finickety there and then just below that we are reminded of course that Ford is inherently an American company it has its roots in America so much so that this bonnet release catch that we pull here has hood printed on it now coming down this is where we start to see things that are a little bit different to uh, you the car that would have rolled out of the forecourt in 1968 so first of all we've got these three switches down here now the first one is a blanking plate the middle one there is a fog and the one on the end is a reverse light. So of course on this car, reverse and fog wouldn't have come as standard. We go down into an oh so modern cassette player and then we come across to these dials here. So we've got a rev counter, you can tell Joe fitted that when he was a teenager, and an oil pressure gauge. Now I think from memory, this rev counter is out of something British Leyland. It's either an MG or a Triumph. Coming in front of us here, it starts to look a little bit like how Ford intended. So across the top, you've got the speedo there. You've got a selection of warning lights, temperature gauge to your left and the fuel gauge to your right. Key is up here. I always find that really weird that it's not either in the center or on the steering column. And over here are our lights. So they're not, again, they're not where you'd really expect them to be. So to get these to work, it's twist for sides and then you pull for main so that's what's on display in front of us but then when we look at the steering wheel we've got the amp meter down here so that tells us if the car the battery is charging or not that is of course an aftermarket fitment and we have two storks so the one to our left is our indicator and our horn and then to the left hand side this is only full beam so it's literally so it's spring loaded so if I was there and somebody was asking my opinion, which in the 1960s they might not have because I don't think women were really consulted as much as they are now, um, I wouldn't have put that there. I would have put the lights there and I would have put a dip beam switch on the floor, which was a lot more standard for cars of this era. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour around what we've got going on inside the car. Let me walk you through the gearbox and then we are going to take her out for a spin because she's really, really sweet and uh, I can't wait to let you hear what she sounds like. Now, with this being a deluxe and not a super, we don't have synchro mesh on first gear. If you'd opted for a super, you would have had synchro on all forward gears and on reverse, I believe, as well. So this is the standard gear knob, so we don't actually have any, uh, <laughs> any numbers printed on it. So we know we've got four forward gears and it is lift to reverse. So put my foot down on the clutch there. We go up into first, into second, third, fourth, and then to get that, we lift that and we bring that down to go into reverse there. Let's get started up because I'm sure that's what a lot of you are waiting for. So, it's still so weird to me that the key is there. She sounds a little bit like she could do some choke actually. So I'll give her a rev inside so you can hear what she sounds like. And then I'm gonna to go to the back of the car and you can hear what she sounds like out there. Pretty decent. So we are going to head out and we're gonna go up through the gearbox. Of course, we'll be setting off in first, which you should never set off from unless stationary if your first gear doesn't have synchro. So we already set that up and uh, we're gonna head off. Joe 
once said to me that the transmission line on the first gear of this sounds exactly like a ghost train. And actually, ever since I've driven this and the Morris Minor, that's all I can ever hear when you hear that woo. I absolutely love it. Now, this is a little bit more tricky to drive than I remember. The clutch feels very, very on off, but honestly, it's one of my, uh, it's one of, as I said, all the way through this video, it's, it is one of my favorite cars of the friendship group. So I am slightly biased. So the thing about the Angler is, is I really feel like it's a classic car for people that appreciate a decent classic car. It's perhaps not as refined as some of the stuff from the 70s and 80s, but remember that when this was sold in 1968, Anglia production had ended in 1967. So by the time that somebody bought this car, it was already an old car. But that didn't really matter much to the buying audience of the 60s, because if you look at some of the other stuff that was available in 1968, like a Morris Minor, this doesn't look really that antiquated, despite the fact that it was at the end of its production life. And of course, it had been replaced by the Ford Escort, which in comparison is far more modern. But that doesn't take away from any of the charm of the Anglia, because despite the fact that we have only got those four gears, and really it does feel like it could do with extra gear, and it's quite noisy, it's quite rattly, it is a really, really nice car to drive. And I hope that you can see as I'm driving that it's really responsive as well in a way that you don't always get from 60s cars. Now, originally this car would have had a 997. It's now got a 1200 from a super fitted. So it is a little bit speedier. So I imagine that if you'd had those four gears and you'd had that 997 engine, I don't think you would have noticed that need for a fifth as much as if as we are noticing today with this 1200. Now, as you can see there, we are going up a bit of a hill, but we're still hitting around 40 miles per hour. So it's not too uncomfortable to the people behind us. Um, but I guess loaded up with, because of course it was sold as a small family car. If you were loaded up with two adults, two or three kids, and perhaps a dog and some luggage as well, it would probably really struggle to have hit 30 there as we went up that hill. Now to say that this was a small family car, really interestingly, especially for the time when competition would have had a four door model available, the Anglia was never available as a four door. And to get around that, Ford said, well, no problem. What we'll do is we'll keep the 100E running longer and we'll badge it up as the 107 and uh, we'll just put the more modern 997 engine in from those standard and those de uh, deluxe cars and we'll just make that the option for somebody who wants a four-door. I mean, can you imagine people doing that nowadays? You would not get away with it. Now, the thing about the Anglia is, is that because of things like the Harry Potter connection, the heartbeat connection, it's one of those cars that has massive hype attached to it. A bit like the Beetle, a bit like the Mini. So when you get into this car, it's loaded with expectation and you kind of have a real high expectation that it's gonna deliver fantastic motoring, something that you're gonna really enjoy. Now, if you've driven a lot of classics like I have, I will be honest, for the era, it is so enjoyable. You've got, of course, that fantastic visibility because you're not hampered by any of those safety features in modern cars. All the pillars are very slim. Your seating position is great. Honestly, I'm sat so high up that even as someone who's only five foot three, I can see right to the end of the bonnet. And when I check my mirrors, I can see right behind me as well. So that builds real driver confidence. And I think apart from being a little bit noisy and a little bit rattly, it's a really pleasurable car of the era and it's so responsive and I've had to turn it around in a car park today so that involved a turning circle, reversing and realistically it outperformed some of the stuff that I've taken out from the 70s. So I'll be honest with you, people get into an Anglia and they've got really high hopes. People do it in Morris Minus as well but I think if you had the money there and you were going to say should I get a Morris Minor or an Anglia, actually and this is, I'm so sorry to all the people that know me for driving a Morris Minor. I think going back in time, when I had that original budget and I was, at the time, I was choosing between a Ford Anglia and a Morris Minor, part of me still wishes that I'd picked an Anglia because they are really lovely. And in my opinion, they are really deserving a lot of the hype that uh, surrounds the car. Now, you only really, in my opinion, start to feel like this car is a little bit dated 
when you start to look at some of the finer details. For example, we only have single speed wipers, we've got no synchro on that first gear, and it is a lot louder than a lot of other cars that came to market at the same time as this. But in my opinion, it's still very deserving of its space. And in fact, while we're talking about the Ford Anglia, I should probably also give you a really interesting bit of trivia in that the Ford Anglia is actually, so the size of a modern parking space, even today, is actually based on how you would park a Ford Anglia and the space that you would need around it. So really, actually, it's no wonder that people nowadays can barely fit those bloated SUVs into parking spaces. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. It's, uh, it's almost like coming full circle because it's the first car I ever tested and uh, I'm testing it today and I feel like the channel has moved on so much and I know that people still watch that Ford Anglia video, the very first car review video I ever did, but I wanted to revisit it with fresh eyes and give it the attention and the love and the research that it deserved because the Ford Anglia is definitely one of my favourite cars in the 60s and it's a lot of people's favourite cars and it gets a lot of favourable press as well and it really deserves it. It's a beautiful car, it's lovely to drive and if you've got deep pockets and could afford one, I would definitely recommend one. So that's it from me. Until next time, take care and drive safely.